I want to start off with a simple question. Why should you care about quantum computers? If you work in any field that is dependent on mathematics or computer calculations in any way, quantum computing is going to help you find solutions to questions once considered unsolvable. If you're someone who cares about cybersecurity, especially the areas of information decryption and encryption, quantum computing is going to revolutionize that ballgame. The entire field of cybersecurity will eventually become entirely dependent on quantum computing to develop new methods of data encryption and protection infinitely more effective than those we have today. If you're a small business owner who wants to perform finance calculations to find where to save money on business costs, quantum computing is going to be an invaluable tool to you. Tools such as quantum annealers allow users to solve series of equations with user assigned weight values in order of priority to find the optimal solution as to where to allocate money. If you have never done any professional work with computers or mathematics in the past and just want to get on with your life, quantum computing is going to help you. Quantum computing isn't some magical gift from the gods destined to be used only by the greatest minds in the field of computer science. It's a way for everyone to find better solutions to the equations that everyone must solve in life. Like the classical computer that swept through the world decades ago, a new wave of quantum computing looms on the horizon, one that will ultimately enable us to optimize daily personal decisions and address humanity's toughest challenges alike. Quantum computers are remarkable machines down to their simplest components. Just as standard computers run on bits, quantum computers run on what are called qubits. While the bits in a classical computer can either hold a value of 0 or 1 at any given time, qubits consist of an object that can attain what is called quantum superposition between two states, that is, the ability to be both 0 and 1, and to every possible value in between. In this case, atomic nuclei are perfect for the job, and there's a lot of different ways to actually prepare these nuclei for use as qubits. To list a few examples, you can place a single atom at a specific position in a silicon crystal and use it as a qubit. Or you can transform the atom into an ion by removing an electron and suspend it in midair using electromagnetic fields. Additionally, superconducting circuits can be used. By pairing up electric charge carriers, circuits begin to behave as if they were a single atom in a quantum state. By using these electric currents to mimic quantum superposition of atoms, the superconducting circuits become qubits themselves. Whether atoms or superconducting circuits are used, however, an underlying issue presents itself. The state of quantum superposition, whether it be displayed by an atom or a superconducting circuit, is incredibly fragile. This is the problem of isolation. Any little change in energy, or heat transfer from the outside world to the qubit, or movement in any immediately surrounding area will greatly affect the state, throwing off the exact state of superposition and ruining any running calculations. Even directly observing the qubits and their work will force them out of this zero and one state. It's like the old Schrodinger's cat analogy. The cat is only both dead and alive while the box remains closed and no one looks inside. And essentially, you end up having to create something like this. This is probably what you'd see in the top few image results if you looked up a quantum computer on Google. But this isn't even the part of the computer that's doing the work. It's just a big, bulky box surrounding the actual computer. The real brain behind the operation looks a bit like this. It's a bit of a shock, seeing how the small the actual computer is compared to the bulky shell that surrounds it, but both play their part. The internal mechanism of this quantum computer is part of the computer that actually houses the qubits. But what about the problem of isolation? How do you keep all of these qubits from being affected by outside forces such as heat? Remember that external computer shell from earlier? The external shell is specifically made to keep out external forces and prevent interaction between the internal quantum computer and the outside world, effectively isolating the machinery inside. The air inside the quantum computer is cooled to near absolute zero temperatures, preventing any heat interaction from disrupting the process of calculation. With our qubits safely isolated from the outside world, they are allowed to work efficiently without interruption. So, now that we got our basic quantum computer model established, let's take a look at some of the types of quantum computers that we currently have. Quantum computers can be generally divided into the following two categories, gate-based computers and quantum annealers. Let's start with gate-based quantum computers. These are the standard quantum computers. 
Gate-based quantum computers allow users to run complex programs using the same logical operations, such as OR and AND, that would be used in classical code. Unlike a classical computer, however, gate-based quantum computers can solve even the most difficult problems in the fraction of a second. The qubits within the gate-based computer allow the hypothetical equation values to be both 0 and 1, and every value in between, allowing every single possible solution to be explored at the exact same time before returning the correct answer. However, gate-based quantum computers are limited in terms of hardware. The more qubits in a gate-based quantum computer, the more complex and difficult the process of calculation becomes. And while adding more qubits opens up the road for faster and more complex problem solving, it is also incredibly difficult to increase the total capacity. Some of the big players in the gate-based computer field include Google and IBM, both of which are greatly investing in developing gate-based quantum computers with more qubits as they have been for years. Quantum annealers are a different type of computer entirely. They are completely unique in the fact that they don't use comparative gates at all. Instead, quantum annealers are specialized in solving very specific equations called binary quadratic models. Though the process of translating a hypothetical scenario into a BQM equation is a complicated task, it comes with great benefits in solving optimization problems. The entire premise of BQM equations is to allow both scenario objectives and restraints to be translated into a mathematical model. The annealer then takes the completed model and translates it into a multi-dimensional graph with peaks and lows. In the case of this graph, the lowest point on the graph is the most optimized value according to the objective and restraint equations transformed into the BQM equation and uses the le least amount of energy. The annealer then runs the test multiple times to see where the lowest point is located. This can be visualized as a person dropping balls above this graph and taking note of where the highest accumulation of balls lowest in the graph is. Additionally, unlike the gate-based quantum computers, annealers can use over 2,000 qubits at once, a huge improvement over their gate-using counterparts, which only have around 50 or 60 qubits. The company D-Wave has been on the pioneering edge of annealer computation and has posted multiple tutorials on YouTube for people interested in exploring the field of quantum annealers. D-Wave also allows users to test their own BQMs on real quantum computers. When it comes to gate-based computers and annealers, you could almost make an analogy to conventional processors. ASICs are to CPUs as annealers are to gate-based computers. ASICs are used for incredibly specific tasks, such as Bitcoin mining, and annealers are used for specific optimization problems, while both CPUs and gate-based computers are used for general operations. Thank you very much for watching my introduction to quantum computing video. I'm going to be making this a series with multiple parts. My next video will be a more in-depth view on quantum annealers and D-Wave. Let's learn about quantum computing together.